Welcome to TEN, the Tenant Experience Network. I'm your host, David Abrams. In this episode, we are connecting with Michael Beckerman, CEO, Cretech and Cretech Climate. In this episode, we learn about Michael's career journey from public relations for commercial real estate to launching a small news aggregator that has grown into something much bigger, now Cretech. Michael saw an opportunity to put a spotlight on innovation in the built world and create a global audience of startups, commercial real estate operators, and venture capitalists. Michael understands the pain points of the stakeholders in the CRE ecosystem and felt that he could provide helpful added value. In our discussion, Michael notes the significant change in power from the landlord to the tenant and the new recognition that customer demands and preferences are going to evolve the industry to deliver a hospitality approach to service. Now more than ever before, real estate companies must think of themselves as a brand. For Michael, it is less about how many days people are in the office and more about the experience that is offered when they are there. Michael's perspective on the rate of technology adoption by CRE provides an insightful context to better understand the pain points for stakeholders. I love Michael's thoughts about the fluidity of the workplace. While he noted the paramount need to focus on the experience people receive no matter where they choose to work. Michael gravitates to the hard things and I so enjoyed our time together and learning about where he sees the industry going in the future. We're excited to share this podcast with you. So be sure to subscribe to 10 so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome Michael to the show. I'm really glad you could be with us today. David, thank you so much for having me. I've been a big fan of yours and the platform. I think uh, uh, we originally met, I guess it was around 2017, and you had a, an idea. I think you had a PowerPoint actually, <laughs> <laughs> before you had a platform. And I was just like, wow, that that is an original idea. And uh, he's going to be successful. I knew that you had the the grit and the experience and the determination. And look at you now. So well, it, it 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 is all those three things. And I can tell you, without them, I wouldn't be here. Particularly uh, given that we met pre pandemic, and in all of my planning for what was to be, I never thought of it to plan for the pandemic. So you're you're right. <laughs> um, no, and, I don't know anybody that did, my friend. True I enough. And I do remember hearing about your first conference in 2017 and reaching out to you, sending you an email, and in about 30 seconds, you replied, and I think we connected uh, on a phone call probably at that time, uh, but you've always been just a, uh, so accessible and such a great supporter, so um, I'm really glad, really glad you could be with us on the program today. Um, so just for all of our listeners, given that it's been a journey for you as well, I'd love to hear about how this all came to be, about how you uh, eventually came to um, create uh, CRE Tech, now Cree Tech, and we'll talk about climate tech as well. Uh, but tell me about how, you know the, that journey and how you got started. Oh, thanks, David. I don't I don't know that it's it's an interesting story, um, but uh, you know, more than happy to share. So so uh, I have only been in one industry my whole career, and that's commercial real estate. I started in my early twenties. A uh, failed college student and uh, was looking just in, for some kind of career path to pay the bills and to put food on the table. And I stumbled upon uh, sort of the commercial real estate industry. And I built a career of all things in public relations, built an agency right. to love, love media, still do, um, despite the, uh, the, <laughs> the extremes it's gone to, but uh, avid reader. Um, and, um, so I, I, built that career, that agency over 25 or so years, it's called Beckerman public relations. My niche was commercial real estate. And I've just been always somebody that's been gravitated, gravitates towards the blank canvas in life that I, I always feel like, at least for me, it's probably why I didn't go to college or most, I think people would say, when you get to the pinnacle of your career, stay there, right? When you get to the pinnacle. When I got to the pinnacle of that business and we were thriving, uh, I decided it's time to look around and do something else. Um, I was just uh, itching for to get my ass kicked and, and learn all, all new skills. And, and uh, so I started to look around and understood that there was no tech sector. 
Um, so I started uh, my actually I built a, a small news aggregator it was sort of my first foray right. on the news funnel still around a couple hundred thousand people use it as a free uh, tool to aggregate uh, real estate news. And around 2016, a good friend of mine, we'll give him uh, props, credit here, Jeremy Neuer, who's a top broker at CBRE and a dear personal friend, had said, you know, I think there's a bigger idea there. And one of the things that I always try and also do, hard to tell with this response, is be a better listener than talker. So when you listen, you can see opportunities. And Jeremy said, I think there's a bigger opportunity for you, given that you know this industry so well. You know, there needs to be sort of a convener of the prop tech sector. At this time in 2016, it was very, very small, as you remember. Yeah. And so, so I started, a, I bought a, a small sort of meetup site called CRE Tech Intersect. And then we started organizing conferences. We rebranded as CRE Tech, Commercial Real Estate Technology. First conferences, uh, you were there from the very beginning, were probably 100, 200 people. And yeah. fast forward through the pandemic, you know, the one coming up in New York, uh, uh, which we'll uh, look forward to seeing you will be you know a couple thousand people. So we've built a sort of a global audience all around. How do we help companies like yourself? Uh, put, how do we put a spotlight on all the great innovation uh, that you and your colleagues are doing and really drive innovation in uh, uh, the built world? So that's kind of uh, what we've been focused on primarily over the last couple of years. Well, you know, I think it's interesting, and um, you know, I, I guess it just reemphasized for me that we actually share a very, uh, very similar uh, path to where we are today. Because again, I, my, I started, ran a marketing communications agency specializing in commercial real estate. I uh, remember. Pitched, pitched in one what was then BC place, now Brookfield Place in Toronto, and uh, you know, again, built up that agency and sort of got to the pinnacle of my career. And again, I, I could have just, I guess, continued to ride that. That role, still a roller coaster a bit, but uh, and instead, you know, abandoned all that for the life of a, a startup founder. So I guess we're both a little bit, you know, oh, a little bit wonky. You're on mute there for a second, Michael. A little crazy, I would say. A yeah. little crazy. So, you know, so why do you think, again, not knowing you'd end up, you know, in this path, why do you think you were so uniquely suited? What has contributed to your success, do you think? Uh, that's just such a good question. Um, I, th I think it's just really understanding this industry, which is, while it's the biggest industry on earth, it's also one that has historically underinvested in, in innovation and technology. And I've also always been fascinated by how this industry moves and evolves. And um, so, you know, when I would meet a lot of the, the, the technology stuff, uh, the startups and and you know they didn't really understand that it was what it was going to take to get their tool adopted. I felt I could add some value there. Right. And then when I would meet with say the chief technology officers or the C-suite of the big real estate companies, I kind of understood what their pain points were, right? In terms of adoption, vetting and adoption, adopting a lot of these tools. And then I also understood from the venture perspective, which types of tools would be best to scale. So I think it was just like sort of like this unique understanding of the ecosystem right. that could then help all the stakeholders within the quote unquote prop tech uh, sector. All right. Makes total sense to me. Um, and I think certainly you have um, created a, a, a very needed enterprise to help navigate between those, those three different stakeholder groups. Uh, let's just fast forward. There's a lot of commentary still today, and it seems like it'll never end on what we call the return to workplace. And obviously some very extreme positions being expressed. Some are confrontational, some are polarizing. Uh, you know, the HILO team believes that everyone needs to live and work in the world as it is right now. It's not about returning to what was normal. Uh, it is about living for today in this new normal. And, and we believe this new normal is not a post COVID normal, but living with COVID. COVID is now part of our world. So I'm just curious, what do you think this all means for the commercial real estate industry? How can buildings continue to be an important part of this much larger workplace ecosystem? A uh, great, no, great question. You know, it's one of the, the reasons why I've been so fascinated with following your particular journey at Hilo is that you know, in my 35 year career in commercial real estate, I've never seen a time where there's been such a, a fundamental shift of, say, power uh, from the 
the landlords to the occupiers, to the tenants. Right. Um, never seen anything like this before. Um, the great blogger, Anthony Slumbers, you know, talks mm -hmm. about space as a service. You and I both know Anthony well. And it, it's, it's, it's a fundamental, it's a paradigm shift in the way that the industry operates, where it used to be, if we build it, they will come, we will sign right. a lease, and we'll see you in, you know, seven, Five ten, years, ten years, you know, whatever it is. And now you're hearing the industry talk about its customer base, which we've yeah. never really talked about. Um, and so I, I think the genie's out of the bottle. And I don't think it's ever going back. And I think it's a good thing because I think that's when we talk about what moves this market, that will move the market. Customer right. demand and customer preferences will absolutely force the industry to adopt. And we're seeing it. You, you, you know, your case in point, I mean, your growth is a reflection of that in, of the industry understanding that's got to have more of a hospitality mentality, that right. the people in the building, how they use it uh, is paramount to, to the success of the building. You know, uh, it's not just got the least term that we wanted. And then we'll see on the other side. It's more about that this is a sea shift in mentality. And I think it's a great thing for the industry. I do too. I, I think that's going to be one of the great outcomes. I, again, I recently interviewed um, John Love fr from Kingset and Brian Rosen from Colliers um, and both. And I'm not sure they would have said this exactly the same way pre-pandemic, but both expressed that their customer now is each and every person that walks into their building every single day. That is a fundamental shift from you know, just being concerned with the key general contact who signs the lease and you don't see again for five or 10 years. Yeah, and I would just echo that, David, by saying, and again, this is, you know, you're, you're the expert in this, in this uh, space. You know, I think the other byproduct is that real estate companies are, have to think of themselves more as a brand than ever before. Right. So the customer does want to know who stands behind that brand, you know, and what do they stand for? Uh, the hospitality, the experience, the technology. Uh, there's so many, you know, climate, there's so many factors that go into it now. And I think the best companies and many of them are your customers are rising to that occasion and seeing this as a tremendous marketing uh, advantage. Uh, no different than what we, we've saw in the, in, the, in the hotel industry, where people seek out certain brands wherever they travel or in the world, they want to stay at that particular brand because of the consistency of service. So we're seeing it in multifamily, we're seeing it in office, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, again, it's a great development for the industry, and I don't think it's going back. So for me, it's less about how many days a week are you in, flex, you know, it, it's, it's more about the experience of... Right the buildings themselves, how they perform and how they service the uh, occupants. And I think that is very, very exciting. It is, you know, um, the industry, listen, real estate, the largest asset class in the world, um, the slowest uh, to be disrupted and the last maybe to be disrupted by technology. Um, we know it was slow before the pandemic. We believe the pandemic has accelerated the rate of adoption and engagement in technology. But again, just, wanting your honest opinion because I'm still seeing it because I'm out there. Yes, I'm seeing tremendous positive momentum, but I'm also still seeing some players thinking, deliberating, wondering, like, have they not realized yet is has what will it still take or what still needs to happen today and everybody to understand what you and I have just been talking about that, you know, the build it and they will come. Those days are gone and we're not going back. So a great, 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 great. It's something I think about and I talk about all the time. Our industry is infatuated and, 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 all, and it's good. It's, I, I'm not trying to poo-poo it, but our industry is infatuated with venture dollars, the barometer for the success and well-being of our industry. And that is a false barometer. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a good one. It's an important one. It's important to understand that in context of other things, though. And the one that I pay attention to the most, and this, it's difficult to measure, but it, again, if you're in the industry as long as I have, and, and you as well, you understand it, and that is adoption, right? Don't talk to me about record months, quarters, years about venture. Talk to me about the adoption curve in our mm -hmm. ecosystem. And there's a lot of reasons why it's still very slow. Number one, 
our industry, our prop tech universe, it's still so young. It's right, only right. a few years old. Yep, so yeah. number one, it's very, very early still, right? Number two, therefore, it's a very fragile ecosystem. Number mm -hmm. three, there's 10,000 startups competing for small market share. Mm -hmm. When you talk to the real estate companies, one of their frustrations uh, with our, our industry is that there's too many individual silos. A lot of the solutions do not integrate. They're looking for single point solutions. And also, when you start to talk to some of these global real estate companies, they're like, well, you know, what I'm using in Toronto, I'm not, I can't use in, in London. So they're looking for more uh, global solutions as well for the big companies. And also the real estate companies, two other four, uh, factors to consider. One, a lot of them don't have the infrastructure yet. They right. don't have all the technology experts uh, and talent to be able to vet, onboard, monitor uh, these solutions. And then, and then the, you know, the last point I would just make is that you know, you're asking an industry that is, is, is the, it's the riskiest industry on earth, because think about it, you know, think about, you come to, you'll be in New York, think about Hudson Yards, think about the risk that it took that right, somebody right. saw to build a city within a city <laughs> on a rail yard. That's right. risk. Yep. But they're risk averse as it relates to technology, because what if that solution that I just spent all this time onboarding fails? Work. What if it doesn't work? So there's a lot of reasons why there's still a long way to go, my friend. Okay, get it. It's challenging, and I hear it all the time that it's frustrating as a tech entrepreneur to try and scale. But the the good ones like yours will they'll get there. That's fair, and I think those are all good points. And I think that uh, the reality is, as you're right, there is a tremendous amount of risk. And you know, when you and I first met, there were far fewer startups than there are today, um, and not all will survive. Um, and, uh, and, and building operators are really trying to navigate their way as best they can. Um, I, 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 I hope that I continue to see those willing to, um, again, try and, and, and take that step forward and be prepared to fail. I know failure is not something that real estate operators tend to really, um, embrace. Um, and so, you know, I think that will, will continue to evolve. Um, you know, I think the pandemic has definitely um, recalibrated the market. To your point, it used to be build it and they will come. We have, and we believe this before the pandemic, but we certainly believe more, believe it now, that, you know, buildings are really places for people, that the real asset are the people. The asset is not the building itself, because we all just lived through a period of time where buildings were relatively empty. Um, as a result, you know, we're seeing tenant experience, workplace experience, workplace engagement, all the new lingo in and around that. You know, fast becoming the new differentiator and often more so than the old historical determinants of location and class. So from your perspective, you know, how will we define great customer experience now and in the future? Hmm. I, I, I think, um, you know, it's such an important conversation. I, I do believe that um, you see, the thing about the real estate sector is uh People that don't really know it, you know, they'll comment on it and they get really excited about the extreme pendulum swings, right? New York, like through COVID, New York City's dead. Uh, you know, this city <laughs> is dead, right? Nobody's ever going back to work. You know, it's never that extreme, right? It's not black and white. There's shades of gray. Yeah. So yeah. when I think about it, um, you know, this hub and spoke model, that, that is not new. This, right. People were going but to the suburbs. That is not new, clearly. <laughs> They're just pendulum shifts. But I think what is fundamental, though, which will not, we will not go back to, is that they experience from the from you know entering a building, mm -hmm. how they get through the building, what they do in the space, the energy uh, management controls, the data that's in the space. Um, through the experiences in the space, the food, the the uh, you know whatever else you're bringing through the high low app into the buildings, um, I think that is what people are looking for. Uh, the the and it's not to suggest. And I read some snarky comments from some of the big um, titans of whether it's Wall Street or the big private equity firms. Is everybody's got to come back and blah 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 blah. You know, I I think it's a good thing that people you know 
like me who have commuted their whole life, it's right. not great. You know, it's not great. It can be better. So mm -hmm. I think the, the degree of flexibility is important. I think the experience is really important. And I think ultimately the, it leads to greater productivity. So I think we'll look back at this period mm -hmm. and actually, you know, see that a happy employee is a productive employee. And right. I think a lot of that has to do with the experience in, in their particular buildings. But I think where they go, how many hours they work, I think that's all going to just be fluid for forever. I mean, it's going to shift and change, but I think paramount will be the experience, right? Again, I, I, I just go back to like, I'm not somebody who, who travels very luxuriously, but I remember one time I was fortunate, I was actually in Toronto to stay at the Four Seasons. And you know, and then you, you know, you, you you come to a level of expectation that the experience, whether it's in Toronto or Washington DC or New York City, that that brand's going to deliver right. to you. They're going to remember who you are. They're going to everything's going to be ready for you. It's going to, and you know, if you have issues, they're going to be responsive. I mean, I think that's where our industry is headed, and I think it's, I think it's a great, great thing. I think you're right, and we've been talking about the the, the hospitality hotel industry as a model for what you know, office buildings need to be, or and even multifamily buildings. Um, it's taken us a long time to get there, but I think that the bound, the, 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 it's blurring. I think, you know, office buildings are becoming more home-like, home you know, multifamily buildings are becoming more office-like, uh, hotels are gonna be a blend of all three, um, and even industrial is involved. We have some great guests that have had um, tremendous experience and breadth and depth in the industrial sector. And, and we're even talking now about tenant experience in industrial buildings, because guess what? Uh, you know who works in industrial buildings? Yeah. People. And robots. <laughs> you gotta take care of the robots. Okay, a few robots too, <laughs> true enough. Uh, let's take a short break and we will be right back. This episode of 10 is proudly brought to you by Hilo. Hilo is a rapid deployment workplace engagement platform for the hybrid world that enables building operators to connect to their tenants, whether they're at work, at home, or anywhere in between. We are in the midst of a seismic shift in the evolution of the workplace. Now more than ever, it's clear that the most important asset of a building is the people. Commercial real estate leaders recognize that tenants and employees want new kinds of spaces, services, and amenities to support having the flexibility to work from anywhere. Workplace engagement solutions that connect hybrid working people to buildings no matter where they are have become a major differentiator as buildings compete to retain current tenants and attract new ones. Hilo empowers building operators to meet this challenge. To learn more about Hilo and schedule a demo, visit HiloApp.com. We're back with Michael Beckerman, CEO of Creek Tech and now Creek Tech Climate, which I look forward to hearing more about. You know, David, I was just thinking about um, there's two industries that I could think of that have changed the least over probably the last couple uh, decades, generations. It's commercial real estate and it's education, right? right? And I think both are due for some real fundamental, whether it's disruption or a rethinking. I mean, you think I think about my kids in school, they're sitting at the same desks that right. probably kids sat in in the 1940s. They're being taught with textbooks that are archaic, right? And, and the whole entire educational experience hasn't changed in forever. And I think the pandemic is, you know, gave us all pause to rethink some of these big, massive industries and the way that they deliver the, the, the product to the end user. And I think education is one that's that's due. And I think certainly commercial real estate uh, as well. Yeah, listen, I, I hate looking for a silver lining um, from an event that was really quite horrible. Um, and, and the pandemic really has just, you know, has that tremendous negative impact on so many people. Um, but to your point, we believe, you know, now is the time to be better, do better, and build something better. Um, and that's where I think industries like commercial real estate um, and perhaps education, which certainly went through a lot of changes during the course of the pandemic, there's opportunity. So I'm just curious, and I know you have some new passions that have emerged um, over the last number of years, but can you share any details about your business or part of your business or a new business that you're now, you know, thinking about or reimagining to reflect the reality of where we are today. Oh, thanks, David. So I just share two two thoughts about sort of where Cretex going, and I where I go is where I believe the thing, uh, the market's going. So these are not always the the you know the easiest sort of grab for growth, 
um, they're hard, they're hard things. And, you know, I, but again, like we talked and I know you as well, I gravitate towards the hard things because, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, when they put me in the box. That's what I want to, you know, remember, like right. I did a lot with a little, right. <laughs> and so, uh, the, the, the two areas that I'm particularly focused on, one is a global, sort of the global prop tech ecosystem, right? And we bought a company in 2019 called Future Prop in London, does what we do in London, smaller scale. And now we're really starting to focus on Europe uh, and see that as a thriving prop tech ecosystem, as well as other parts of the world like APAC. Latin America, Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some really, really exciting innovation, and uh, that's taking place globally. So, when I when people think about Cretech, I, you know, I want them to start to see that this is not just a North American right. marketplace. This is a global uh, yep. ecosystem now. And the second for me would be climate. Um, mm -hmm. I've always considered myself an environmentalist. Blessed to have a beautiful piece of property that I uh, consider sacred to me. Um, and, um, but I didn't realize the built world's, uh, sort of responsibility as it related to greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions, that it was 40% of all carbon emissions. I, I had no idea. And I didn't, I discovered that very late in life as always a couple of years ago. And I said, well, as long as I'm running Cretech and we've got a big audience of hundreds of thousands globally, and I think we've got a good reputation, I hope, um, uh, despite the incompetence of its CEO, uh, I'm going to make this my mission to decarbonize the built environment. And so I'm, you know, we launched Cretech Climate, which is, which is just a building a separate community within mm -hmm. the prop tech ecosystem uh, to really focus the tap, you know, the, the industry on understanding its responsibility. And again, like we talk, it's opportunity to lead the world right. in changing. And in doing so, can just create just a, a, a healthier planet. So I'm very, very focused on, on, um, on climate. Uh, and again, my lens will always be through technology. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm very focused on uh, getting the, the information out there and the content out there so that the industry, you know, has doesn't have to wait until they're old like me to realize, oh, my goodness, we're 40% of all carbon emissions. That's more than any other industry on earth. Let's do something about this. So that's, you know, it's probably the hardest but most important uh, challenge of my my long, long career. Right, so, well, so, yeah, very, kudos very, to you, kudos for you for seeing it and for taking it on and uh, and making it such an, an important initiative side by side, um, yeah. and giving it that prominence. So um, I look forward to hearing more about that as I'm sure I will at the conference as well. Um, a closing speed round. We always like to get to know our guests a little bit better beyond the work that we do. So a few questions for you. Can you share one way in which the pandemic has changed your outlook on life? Wow. Um, I, I think it's uh, like a lot of people. Um, what it gave me a pause to see is how much time I waste commuting mm -hmm. <laughs> and how much unproductive time I have. It just you know, traveling, uh, and I could be much, much more efficient and effective and happier uh, working from home and being much more strategic about, you know, the meetings that I take and, and where they are. Now we're a small company, so it's, it's easier uh, to do that. But I, I, I think it would be really just about the quality of uh, my working hours uh, was a big shift for me. Great. What travel destination do you miss most? Um, the one I just went to, Lake Louise and Banff, because does that count? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. I want to go back. Uh, I want to go back. Canada. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, living in the uh, in the shadow of New York City, uh, I, I love New York, but it's a city that I know incredibly well my whole life. Uh, I think it was for me, it was more just seeing new cities, you know, it was yeah. fortunate to, to, to stage a climate event in Copenhagen, uh, which was extraordinary experience. Europe for me is, is just a wonderful new frontier in terms of business and travel. So I think if, when I do get back on those airplanes, I think it'll probably be, it won't be domestic. It'll be more. Okay. Sounds good. Anything new on your bucket list that you'd like to experience? Wow. Anything new on my bucket list? Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, 
I'm an avid hiker. So I, I think uh, just taking on some really extraordinary hikes uh, over the next couple of years is on my list. I have some friends that have done some really intense, uh, intimidating hikes. So thing, you know, traveling to probably Patagonia or yeah. Peru and, and, and some other places in the world and really getting outside into the elements and camping and doing things like that and uh trying to hopefully get some more fly fishing in which is another passion of mine which uh oh, interesting up with uh over the last couple of years all right very cool uh what's your favorite technology that is new to your life because you're a technology guy am i well i don't know you love technology <laughs> anything anything don't new ask my kids man my kids will tell you <laughs> freaking moron when it comes to operating my phone or my ipad um yeah i got one my my hyundai my my new ev oh which nice. absolutely the the ionics i always get the name wrong i just love it i'm not a car guy i'm not really yep. much of a material uh, uh you know person but this car i absolutely love and amazing uh, great very cool so i think i already know the answer to this question but uh, just to clarify what is your personal choice for days spent in person with your colleagues versus working from anywhere? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll caveat that by saying, where do you think you're heading in that mix? Um, wow, wow, wow. I, don't, I haven't really thought too much about that. I mean, the work from home is working for me, right? right. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Uh, I, I think it's more uh, international travel, more international travel also focused on climate. Right. Um, so if I'm where I'm going to spend my time is just going to any place I can in the world to deliver the message about the climate crisis and how the built world could play a leading role in addressing the crisis. So. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm absolutely anxious to get back on the road in that context. Great. Makes total sense. Uh, Michael, I am so glad we were able to schedule this time together. Um, and I'm looking forward to being in New York because New York is my favorite uh, city in North America. There you go. Uh, so I will be taking an extended trip on both ends of the conference, um, meeting with clients and prospects. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at the at the conference. Any any final plug for the conference that you'd like to, to push here? I mean, I, I think we're just that, you know, when people come to the conference, you know, it's really, really important to me that the t that they get, uh, it's a great experience for them that uh, whatever they're looking for, whether they're raising money or they're looking for customers or uh, it's, it's venture looking for deals or corporates looking for solutions. I just, you know, I hope that it's a very immersive, uh, fun, but productive experience for them over two days. And while it's it's a very large conference now mm -hmm. compared to when you were started following us. Right. Um, I still hope that um, it's a great experience for people. I take a lot of pride in making sure every single person that walks through that door had a good experience. And I think the last thing just about the show is that what gives me great hope about our ecosystem to your point about adoption is that, you know, I, I don't, when I, I do a lot of the programming uh, and I try not to focus on very, uh, a lot of minutia, like a lot of like, you know, how to's or uh, very sort of uh, specific topics. What I try and focus on is companies, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I believe that what the industry is looking for is inspiration. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about our ecosystem is that the playbooks are all shared. So you get a massive real estate company like Oxford or Jamestown or Boston Properties or, you know, uh, P. Jim, uh, Tishman Spire. They're going up on stage and they're telling people what their playbook is. Right. right. And so what, what gives me great hope and, and, and real great pride is that we've got more real estate companies participating than at any time we've been doing that. So to your point about adoption, I think that's a pretty good sign. Right. That's great. All right. Thank Dave, you. Listen, I got to thank you, my friend. I'm going to interrupt as always. You know, <laughs> you you've been you've built a great platform in Hilo, and I've been a fan from day one. But you know, the other thing that you're doing is you, you're a great advocate for the industry. You're a great storyteller, and I'm a huge fan of this podcast. You've had some great guests on. Love the Bob Knackle one, 
Um, and, uh, you know, you're doing, you know, it, it's, it's what I love. That's why I love my job so much. Cause I get to work with people like you on a daily basis. And it's, it's, you know, it's this great expression that the, one of my favorite poets in the world, Bruce Springsteen says is in the end, nobody wins unless everybody wins. And, Fair you know, enough. and you're a perfect uh, example of that sort of philosophy. So thanks for having me on the podcast, but mostly thanks for all that you do for our industry. Likewise, an absolute pleasure, and I will see you in October. Thanks, my friend. Take care. I want to thank Michael Beckerman for joining me on this episode of 10 and for contributing to the global conversation around buildings being a part of a robust ecosystem that can help to build great companies and that they are vital in the effort to cultivate and support great people and teams. The future of the workplace will likely take many forms, and we will continue to explore what that looks like together. Subscribe to 10 for more conversations with leading CRE professionals and experts who all have something to say about tenant experience and the future of the workplace. We love hearing from you, so if you enjoyed this episode of 10, please share, add your rating, and review us through your preferred podcast provider. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work and live. Thank you.